All right, so we ended the last segment just touching on sex limited traits. So I wanted to do um, another example of traits that can be just limited depending on what sex the organism was. So one of these examples is feathering in, in um, cocks. And so the this trait is really unique because it's and it's classified as being sex limited because it is an autosomal trait that is recessive but only in males. So the females tend to look like this over here where they have very very short feathers um, and they they tend to have either the homozygous um, or the heterozygous trait um, or they can even have the the homozygous recessive trait as well but they're always going to look like this and have the short tail feathers um, because they're female so this trait is only going to be expressed in males and so males if they have the homozygous recessive trait they're going to have long tail feathers but if they are homozygous dominant or heterozygous they're going to have very short tail feathers so it just depends on um, the interaction of what the genotype actually is and the sex of the individual and that's going to de that's going to depend on the phenotype. We also see um, sex limited traits in humans specifically around the trait precocious puberty so or attaining puberty early. So this is um, a, actually a genetic defect and so males that um, come into puberty and have this trait tend to do so very early in life like four or five years of age and they tend to be very very short because as testosterone uh, increases through the puberal process it actually has the ability to ossify or stop long bone growth so the you're running around with a bunch of, um, you know, like little and four year, four and five year old um, individuals that are fully developed as a man, and they are fully fertile at this point in time too. So this is an autosomal dominant trait, um, and the allele that's associated with precocious puberty is a um, capital P. And so again, this is going to only be expressed in males. Don't get it confused with precocious puberty in females. That's a totally different thing and actually not genetic at all. All right, so if we're looking um, at our inheritance patterns and we have our parent generation here, we have an individual that is heterozygous for precocious puberty and a male that is, um, no, sorry, a female that is, has normal um, genotype for puberty, so um, little p, little p. Then in our F1 generation, we get um, we get uh, a portion of the individuals of the males that actually are going to go through precocious puberty because they have that dominant allele at one position on the loci. And then in our females, even though they're carriers, half of them are going to have that big um, normal uh, normal um, genotype, um, they're still going to go through normal puberty because it's really only expressed in males. All right, so in our P generation, if we do a back cross, sorry, nope, this is the same example. I thought this was supposed to be a different slide. Um, but if we, so this is the same example. So if our parent generation, um, oh, no, nope, it is a different slide. Sorry, guys. So in this example, in our parent generation, if we have a male that um, displays normal puberty, therefore has the genotype of little p, little p, and that male is then crossed with a female that has the heterozygous genotype, so she has that precocious puberty um, allele plus a normal allele. And then in the F1 generation, what ends up happening is half of the males will end up being or going through precocious puberty because they end up inheriting the big P half of the time from the mom. And then our females are all going to go through normal puberty because this gene isn't expressed at all, or this phenotype isn't expressed at all in females.
All right, so let's talk really quickly about cytoplasmic inheritance. This is uh, a portion of genetics that I just find truly fascinating. So cytoplasmic inheritance really doesn't deal with the genome that is encompassed inside the nucleus at all. This has to do with the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is going to be the powerhouse of the cell. So it's the energy generator of the cell, and it's floating around in the cytoplasm. The unique thing about the mitochondria is that um, in the cytoplasm or the chloroplast, it actually has its own little genome. And it's not very big. It only has 35 to 37 genes total. Um, and, um, but the, and that's compared to about 35,000 genes that are expressed in, as part of the nuclear material. So cytoplasmic inheritance is really kind of a unique situation because um, the, as mitochondria go through cell division, those, that mitochondria genome is going to segregate randomly as gametes are formed. So not all of the genetic material is actually going to divide evenly or even systematically within the cell. So you could get some genes that get... Um, you know, copies of really efficient mitochondria and some genes that don't get very efficient copies of mitochondria. So um, this is really kind of an interesting phenomenon because um, as, you know, if we think about um, mammals, they, the mitochondria is going to be in, or, um, inherited from the mother. And so this is uh, that concept of maternal inheritance. So this is a really big deal in the racehorse industry because the big heart um, phenotype that is associated with triple count crown winners like Secretariat and a bunch of the other um, triple count crown winners in the 50s and 60s um, is directly linked to the mitochondria. And so the, the choosing of the mare um, in these animal breeding um, or selection decisions is really, really important. All right, we also see um, cytoplasmic inheritance at work um, in some of our plant species as well. So Carl Korins actually showed this in the early 1900s. And so this is um, a flower that has a leaf, um, leaf that's going to be um, dictated by the maternal chloroplast or the DNA. So pollen absolutely has no effect on the phenotype of the progeny. The, the phenotype is going to be determined by the uh, maternal chloroplast DNA rather than the contribution from both the gametes. Another genetic maternal effect um, we can actually see in the in the twist of snail shells. So um, offspring's uh, phenotype that is going to be determined is actually going to be determined be determined not by its own genome or genotype, but by the genotype of the mother. So this is um, adding another layer of complexity to the expression of these traits. So in seashells, um, they can uh, curl one of two ways. They can coil to the right, and that is going to be termed dextral, or they could coil to the left, and that's going to be termed senstral. And so the mother's genotype is actually going to determine the offspring's phenotype. So if we take a look at this example here, in our parent generation, we've got um, our dextral male and our sinistral female. Those are going to be crossed. In the F1 generation, we get 100% heterozygous, and all of those individuals are going to have the sinistral phenotype. If we allow the F1 generation to intercross with each other in the F2 generation, we get, we get a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio here. Um, but all of the phenotypes are dextral because the, um, the, the um, phenotype was, um, was determined by the mother's phenotype. Okay, so you can see that this dextral or this left-handed curve is going to be the phenotype for that F2 generation. So as we take a look at this a little bit closer, 
We've got the, um, the direction of our coiling patterns. S plus is going to equal the dextral or the dominant right coiling pattern. And a little s is going to be sinistral or the recessive left pattern. And um, but so even in the F1 generation where we get 100% heterozygous, the phenotype is still going to be um, determined by the mother's genotype. So the mother was sinistral, so the F1 um, phenotype is going to be sinistral as well. Even though the genotype is heterozygous, and it, you would think that it should be dextral, but it won't be. So in the F1 generation, as we allow self-fertilization to take place, it produces the 1 to 2 to 1 genotype. But all the phenotypes are dextral because of the mother's genotype. Um, so that, that um, her genotype, um, the heterozygous genotype of the mother, is really going to determine the F2 generation's uh, phenotype as well. All right, so let's just make sure that we get some terms down. Um, cytoplasmic inheritance is going to be different than genetic maternal effect. Cytoplasmic inheritance is going to be transmitted through the mother's mitochondrial DNA, whereas the genetic maternal effect is the influence of the mother's genotype on the phenotype of the offspring. So two very different concepts at play here. All right, so... After the next segment, we'll uh, finish up chapter 5.